Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson. And as you know, gold and silver have been taking a beating lately. And the airwaves and print media, at least in the West, are full of stories about how the gold bull run is over and that it's headed back to the basement, presumably forever. And yet we here at Peak Prosperity remain steadfast in our view that gold's long, unbroken history of winning battles against mismanaged and overprinted currencies will turn in a repeat performance in the near future. To understand gold, well beyond the simple and distorted views promoted by a financial system that has deep conflicts of interest on the subject, you need to understand its history, what money really is and truly does for a society, and a little bit of human psychology to grasp why fiat money unerringly loses value over time, sometimes catastrophically. To help us go deeper and understand why gold remains the very best store of value, especially in these times, is Nick Barashev, the president and CEO of Bullion Management Group and author of the newly released book, $10,000 Gold, Why Gold's Inevitable Rise is the Investor's Safe Haven. Nick Barashev has focused on the world of precious metals and the advantages of investing in gold, silver, and platinum bullion for over a decade. And in 2002, interestingly, he launched... BMG and BMG Bullion Fund, Canada's only retirement savings plan eligible open and mutual fund trust that invests directly in gold, silver, and platinum bullion, which means he knows how to navigate the sophisticated, complex, and sometimes arcane worlds of financial products and regulations. Welcome, Nick. I know I'm going to enjoy this conversation. Well, I'm a pleasure to to be on your show, Chris, and it's uh, good talking to you again. Fantastic. Well, Let's start with a punchline and then go deeper to understand it better. Your book is titled with the idea of gold going to $10,000. Now, of course, you certainly penned that title before the recent pummeling of gold in April of 2013. Would you change the title if you could pen it today? Uh, absolutely not. And normally in, in the past, like I've, I've, as you mentioned, you know, started the fund you know, way back to 2002, and actually it took four years before then to to get regulatory approval. So I've been doing this ever since. And, and uh, although I knew gold was, was rising, I was reluctant to, you know, to put a, a number and a time frame. And when I say $10,000 gold, I don't mean this year or even next year. It's, it's, it's probably a plus or minus five-year scenario. But what changed my mind uh, was in 2011 when... The, in the U.S., the, there was the raging debate over the debt ceiling. Mm-hmm. And when you listen to that, like, first of all, the gold price went up 30% in the three months during, you know, preceding and during the debate, because then the, the, by having the debate, the, the, the deep problems that the debt ceiling represented were, were debated on, you know, on, on the media, like, virtually daily. And when you looked at that, you could see that there was no political will or ability to ever change that. And because there, there, it's impossible to either increase taxes, you know, or cut expenditures enough to really make a difference. And, and you know, you're not going to grow your way out of it. Nobody's predicting that, that that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. So the only choice left is, is, is essentially you know, in, in simplified terms, to call it printing. And when you look at that, then, then what you get is that the printing is going to continue, the deficits are, are going to continue, and in fact, they're going to increase. And the interesting point is that if you plot U.S. debt versus the gold price, you almost get perfect correlation. Hmm. So this is just a straight progression. Like if you keep printing at the rate you're printing, you're going to get to 10,000. 10,000 is by no means the peak, and people have tr- trouble coming to grips with 10,000, but if you hit 10,000, and then we're into hyperinflation, and the numbers after that will sound absurd. And so I want to talk about that history, because you're mentioning something that's happened time and time again, which is 
uh, a country gets a little overextended and decides that printing is the way out. And of course, that's happened a lot. Now, in your book, you talk about um, that there are five stages that irredeemable fiat currencies seem to go through. And I, I think that's a really helpful framework for people to understand. First, that it, this has happened time and time again, whether the coinage was uh, debased by actually pulling it in and replacing the precious metal content with copper, or later on, it was actual physical paper printing. Or today, you, you punch a few keyboard strokes, and next thing you know, you've got extra zeros showing up on in, in credit balances in various institutions. Walk us through those stages. Stage one, what, what is that? Well, it, I, I don't know if we, we have enough time to go through the stages, but I think that the the important thing there to, to know is that throughout all of history, there has never been a, a single instance where a fiat currency didn't end in hyperinflation and co complete collapse. There isn't one example of a successful fiat currency. Because the simple issue is, is that if you give a printing press in simplified terms to a to a politician, a king, an emperor, a president, a prime minister, you name it, they will overuse it every single time. That's just human nature. And that's, that's what happens. It, it's, you know, partially a deficiency in democracy because democracy will also always have people vote themselves a bunch of benefits that the politicians promise to get elected. And that's how you get this spiral effect that keeps going. So the, the, the end result is the same. This time around, though, we're in uncharted territory because you've got global fiat currencies and you've got a global reserve currency. So unlike hyperinflations in the past, like everybody knows about Germany, it was, it was restricted to a country. This time it's going to be global. Well, global, and, and I noticed in your in your five stages that it, it's just basically walking through the process of going from first trying out an unbacked fiat currency and everything seems fine for a while, and then it gets overused and abused. And, and so today, I would note that there are certain proponents on, on the monetary side, uh, maybe the Paul Krugman, Ben Bernanke uh, side, who, who are claiming that not only have we not overprinted, and not only are deficits not a, a big deal, but we actually haven't gone far enough. Uh, where do you fall on that story? How, how do you, uh, it, uh, could they be right? Well, in, in, in terms of the short term, there's probably no other choice but to print more, because we, we'd have a, if, if the Fed pulled back in its current quantitative easing, we'd have a massive depression. So for, for the moment, that you, you print more, but the problem is what happens down the road. That, that's the point. So when, when the results happen, Greenspan's already retired. Ben Bernanke may be retired by then. And then you have the consequences. But for the moment, the, the, this, this keeps the ship afloat and the pain minimized for the time being. Well, so it, let's let's walk down this road because I want to understand what happens here. I think it's essential to getting to ten thousand dollar gold. So, let, ultimately, I, I guess the final moment in or final moments in in uh, a currency uh, finally losing its value. If people experience it as as inflation and they talk about it as rising prices, but in fact, what's happening, as I understand it, maybe you could help add some light to this or correct me if I've got this wrong, but. The, the things that have real value retain that value, and what happens is the amount of currency gets reset against that. Uh, That's right. and so, so all we're talking about is a great reset, where if there's a trillion dollars outstanding, but there's only a billion dollars worth of stuff out there, suddenly it looks like that stuff costs a trillion dollars. Um, but That's, that's right. All right. It's, so, it's really, so what's happening now in, in terms of gold? It's not that gold price is rising because you know, of jewelry demand or something. It's the currencies all over the world are depreciating as measured in gold. So gold looks to be rising because you can't tell the currencies are depreciating because they're all depreci depreciating at plus or minus the same pace, but all against gold. So it looks like gold is rising in all currencies, but all, all of them are overprinting. Well, now let's, let's talk about the recent 
price action of gold, because of course, as I, I mentioned before, there's plenty in the airwaves right now to suggest that uh, <laughs> the gold bull run is over. Uh, there was this extraordinary takedown uh, of gold price in April, which uh, of course, there's been no investigation of it. Uh, it's It's been presented as if that was normal market action, but it was a historic event in the sense that we hadn't seen a similar swan dive in, in over 30 years. Uh, what was your, your take on that? You probably had a, a pretty front lines view of that, and I'd just be interested to um, have your observations on what happened there. Well, I think the starting point there is is I tend to not think of gold as an investment. I mean, if anything, it's an anti-investment. You're choosing not to invest. But when I talk about that kind of gold, that's bullion in a vault. Okay, mm-hmm. And whether you have bullion in a vault or a stack of Swiss francs or a stack of euros or whatever... They're not invested. They're just sitting in the vault. Mm -hmm. And while they're sitting in the vault, you're not going to get any interest or dividends. So that that myth about gold doesn't pay any interest or dividends applies to any currency. Mm -hmm. You put it in a vault, stack it, you you, you know, you're not getting any interest or dividends. So I don't consider that, that gold, you know, was in a bull market to begin with. Because it's, it's not like you know copper or zinc or the, you know the, the equity markets where they are investments, and some of the the paper proxies and derivatives of gold are investments, but you know physical bullion in a vault, you know coins, um, you know that that you hold in your possession and so on and so forth. That's just money. Everything else is a debt-based currency. What happens is that people always say, well, that, that's ridiculous. You know, gold's an archaic relic. You know, we have all this modern digital stuff. Well, I say, well, why don't you go and read the, the U.S. governments, the Canadian governments, any other government you choose, and see what they think is, is that. So if you look under assets, under assets, you will have monetary assets. And when you go to the footnote to see what monetary assets are, there are foreign currency reserves and gold. So obviously the governments around the world, the central banks, understand that gold is a monetary asset. They don't call it jewelry, okay? But they promote it to everyone else as, as if it's not money. But it's, it's the only thing that is money. Everything else is a debt-based currency. So when you start from there, then it becomes clear that the currencies are, are losing value against real money gold. And the, the paper side, the derivative side, whether it's the, the COMEX futures contracts, the, uh, you know, the, the GLD ETFs and, you know, options and all the rest of it, those are investment. They're momentum trades. They're, they're, they're so on. But gold in a vault, that's just money that isn't invested. Well, so one of the things I've observed about lots of markets, gold and silver are included in this, but there are other markets that I've seen this happen in as well. Oil, uh, certain equities, all kinds of things is that um, the the way the market is structured right now, there are insiders or, or p- certain participants have different advantages than you or I might. And I noted that way back in January, there was already a, a what I would call a a psychological campaign to start talking gold down. You had uh, some of the big bullion banks and research houses starting to talk about how gold had topped, and then they all started accumulating these large short positions, and then the, the in the media there was this really sort of amplification over time. And then by the time we went from January through to April, it, we were ripe for a fall at that point in time, um, simply because there was... Uh, this is, I believe, how many big traders make their money. This is a wash, rinse, repeat sort of a thing. They've, I've seen these bear raids many times in the past, and, sure. and they, they do it because they make money at it. Right. Well, but it's also facilitated by, by the rules. And, and one of the issues are, is that you're essentially allowed naked shorting you know, on, on the COMEX, which is illegal in the financial markets. Okay, so so this is where you get these kind of distortions because you can create the kind of events that happen, you know, in April by s- selling an, an unbelievable amount, like the estimates are up to 400 tons 
of futures contracts when you have no gold to begin with. So that that's where the flaw come comes in, and and the COMEX has has limits on in terms of how much you you can sell, which is supposed to be restricted to three thousand contracts. So although we don't have the the data, either fourteen traders traded three thousand contracts at exactly the same time each on exactly the same day, or one trader did thirty thousand contracts. Mm-hmm. That was the Friday. So when, when you allow that, then then you're going to have massive distortions in in the in the paper price as a result because it's like starting a snowball. Um, you, know, you you start with that, but then right after that, you're triggering stops, and following that, you're triggering margin calls, and then the the selling kind of continues, and the price keeps dropping. In this case, the first time is the reverse happened in the physical markets. It went the other way. The premiums went up. So if if you look at the prices in many cases with premiums added in, the price didn't change. For what sorts of products? Well, c- c- coins, and it didn't, in, didn't include the, 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 the largest bars, but um, primarily for the coins and in and, and, in terms of people actually, you know, there, there was no lineups at the coin shops of people selling their their physical bullion. There was lineups trying to buy, and the coin shops quickly ran out. The mint ran out. Both the Canadian and the U.S. mint, you know, got got instantly backlogged. So that, this is kind of where you you've got when when you have this kind of distorted paper price to the physical price, and. And I've always said that this was going to happen like in, in a much bigger way sooner or later. Uh, but it's already happened. Like going back to, I don't know if you remember, in 1998, Ford Motor Company bought a billion dollars worth of palladium yeah. in a yeah. private transaction at twice the prevailing spot price. Because you can't build cars or catalytic converters with paper palladium. So there is a difference. Yep. The same thing happened. China bought potash a few years ago at twice the price, and also, also China ended in, uh, entered into a long-term contract with Russia for oil at seventy-five bucks a barrel when the price was thirty-seven. So that's where you get the examples of the difference between the the physical asset and and the, you know the paper speculation on proxies and derivatives. So you're saying one of the end stage events will be uh, divorcing of the paper price that we see at comics and the physical price required to actually obtain it if you can. Um, and we certainly saw this, I think, you know, one of the things we observed down here talking with a variety of dealers at the retail level, obviously there was tremendous shortages for both gold and silver products at the retail level. It took the mints a while to catch up. I, they're catching up at this point in time is, is our assessment. Right. Um, did you see that uh, same behavior in, in your individual clients and secondarily, were there any um, shortages or delays in the, in the large bar markets? No, we didn't, we didn't experience uh, any, and, and it seemed that the, um, the, the shortages, delays, and price increases in the large bar markets were, were, were in you know, the East, Southeast Asia, and China, and so on. Uh, but it didn't, didn't seem to have happened here, but it depends on the size. At the, at the time, we had, you know, we didn't have any large buyers. We did in in our bars program, like we have the the the, the funds, but but we also um, provide the large bars for sale and storage to high net worth investors. So we we had some some additional buying. We had a um, number that are in process that. People realize that you know they held uh, precious metals accounts in Switzerland that that didn't you know that they didn't own any precious metals actually. So so that, that's been that's been kind of what what's been the evolving change. All right. So when when uh, talk me through what you think this final event will look like and how we'll detect it. Um, and, and what I'm interested in here is sort of painting the picture for listeners that. Uh, when this final moment comes, my view is that you you either have your position in gold and silver or you don't. 
Um, if you don't, you'll find yourself uh, either priced out of the market or in the equivalent of like those bidding wars that happened for real estate when, when things really started to heat up and get tight where where you know you submit your bid and uh, you you get outbid by somebody else and so you chase. And at, at any rate, I think my view is that gold and silver will be difficult to obtain at some point, potentially. Uh, how do you view that? Um, absolutely. I think that, that particularly for the larger you know, institutional buyers and high net worth investors, uh, they have the biggest concern and they need to, to get in as quickly as possible because they, that they, they, they won't be able to get an, you know, a decent allocation if they wait too long. I mean, the retail investor, you'll always be able to buy, you know, a coin or something like that at a premium. But, you know, if you had to buy, uh, you know, tens of millions or a hundred million or a billion, you're going to have a big problem. Uh, that even today would have to be done, you know, carefully and, and carefully spaced. So it's not something you just, you know, write a check for a billion dollars and you've got your gold. That's not going to happen. Right. Well, let's talk about that for a second because uh, the big institutional money and also the, the large um, family fund, endowment, pension, let's talk big money pools for a moment. What what sort of ownership of gold exists in those at, the, at present? Well, the statistics I've heard, it's that it's less than a half a percent of, of um, holdings on a retail level, and in the institutional level, if you combine mining stocks and physical bullion, it's less than one percent. So it's minimal. So all these discussions about uh, you know that you know the gold bubble is burst and it's all over and so on. Well, you know there that never was a bubble, and it didn't happen because it's so underowned. You know, still today after. You know, being the best performing asset class for the last you know eleven years, so that, that's a long ways ways away from any kind of bubble territory, and this isn't going to be a bubble. It's not going to be like uh, you know the high tech bubble that then you know was based on irrational exuberance and bursts. This is going to be more like a you know panic buying, you know to to get rid of the worthless paper. That's not a bubble. Right. Well, if if we did have a gold bubble, it would be the first bubble in recorded human history which had fractional percentage uh, participation. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Well, so I, the the gold bubble talk has always been silly to me because um, uh, you can't, uh, by definition, a bubble has mass participation, and we have not yet seen that in gold, at least in this country. But I want to talk now real quickly about... So the what I'm interested in is, is what the triggers might be that would lead to this next stage of, of gold's uh, revaluation and, and normalization against currency. I hesitate to call it a big price rise in gold. Uh, instead, it's going to be a, a sort of a remarking against existing currency. So one of the trigger points for me is is I know that looking up through the mid '60s, late '60s, uh, you know, all of a sudden, you know, the the Bretton Woods agreements un, unraveling, and France and other countries are demanding their gold. In August 15, 1971. Uh, Nixon has to slam the gold window. And, and that's because there had been this steady erosion and hemorrhaging of gold over time from uh, U.S. possession. So fast forward, slightly analogous situation, I think, is that the entire West, which would include you know, basically all the OECD countries, but primarily it's going to be you know, New York and London, uh, are, are busy telling us that gold is undervalued. And, and people in India and China in particular, but also Russia, other countries, uh, seem to be saying Yahoo, and, and they've been buying massive amounts of gold. I've been stunned at the numbers, uh, hundreds and hundreds of tons per quarter you know, just going uh, into these countries. And, and so it feels analogous to me that there's this now hemorrhaging and erosion of gold away from the West to the East. Uh, is that something that you're observing, and, and do you think it's significant? That's clear, you know, because because if you if you look through the uh, the last year's you know supply demand reports, like in the 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 North American demand is like a fraction of of demand in you know other parts of the world. So it's it it's uh, it hasn't uh, kind of it hasn't registered in North America, and particularly in Canada. Um, that we've never had a currency crisis. People uh, don't see that Canada has any, you know, issues, and you know we don't have the huge unfunded liabilities that the U.S. has, and so on. So we're somewhat complacent here about 
the way things are, but when you look at the rest of the world, they're they're in varying degrees of of dire straits in terms of you know debts, deficit, unsustainable positions, and and that's where in in my book I'm covering like I tried to distill it down to some macro trends that you know. We, we can have all the noise and events, and this might happen and that might happen, but the, the, there are some some major trends that are happening that are not reversible. And and one is that you know as as the baby boomers are retiring, that's going to be a huge shift in terms of of uh, the effect on GDP and government revenues because you're shifting from people contributing the economy to people taking away, and that's a that's that's going to be a massive shift that started. I believe the numbers are something like ten thousand a day. So so the deficits, as high as they are now, are going to are are going to grow exponentially. And you know, you add Obama's Medicare to the equation, well, that, that's going to be a, a giant uh, further you know rise as as people need more and more medical care as as they uh, get older. So, so we've got that. That's that's an unstoppable train by itself. The issue of peak oil, all those talk of you know, shale and this and that, and the other thing. But talking about you know conventional oil has 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 peaked and is in decline, and the other methods are are going to be more expensive oil one way or another uh, when it when it all gets done. The the issue there is that other than printing money, rising oil prices are the only other thing that you know creates price inflation across the board and everything. So you've got that, you know, irreversible trend. And the other thing is that unemployment rate is is going to, you know, it's it's systemic. Like the the jobs have been outsourced overseas; they're not coming back. And you know the the when they when they when and if they do come back because of high oil prices, the 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 manufacturers are going to be fully automated with robotics. It's not going to be a manual assembly line like like it was when the people got laid off. So so all these things put together it just means you know you know lower GDP, uh, lower tax revenues, higher higher deficits. You know by the year. And and just that simple correlation, you know, will will get you to the ten thousand dollar goal price. And that's absent any sort of trigger or exogenous event or anything. Oh, yeah, that's uh, just progressing as is with all the existing knowns. I mean, there's there's many events, and uh, they they haven't gone away from you know when gold was nineteen hundred. They've all gotten worse. There isn't nothing's been solved. Nothing's been cured. It isn't getting better. Um, there's all this talk about inflation being under control, but that's that's still you know simply selective statistics over what reality is. John John Williams has you know is more accurate in terms of what real inflation is, and and it's closer to ten percent. And at ten percent in inflation, you've got huge negative real interest rates. Um, that, that's totally unsustainable. Well, let's talk about owning gold for a, for a minute, because when you talk about the potential tailwinds for gold uh, on just the fiscal recklessness side, also the monetary printing, we have events like Cyprus, and then all the noise that's come out uh, first across Europe that potentially there's going to be bail-ins of depositor accounts, meaning that uh, my personal faith and trust in the banking system has been eroded because they basically said, hey, we're going to gamble with your money, and if we lose, we'll take yours, we'll take your money. And then we saw even Canada come out and say that a bail-in was a possible way to deal with a systemic crisis. And the U.S. did it, and, and also New Zealand. And, and and we're starting to see now lots of reasons to have um, loss of faith in institutions, MF Global, you name it. Talk to me about how you own gold in that environment where you can have the trust and confidence that uh, your wealth will not be confiscated. Well, First of all, you need to understand that you know. I think the Cyprus situation, you know, brought things to light. But there's there's plenty of cases in the U.S. in terms of what a deposit is. When you when you just have a regular, you know, cash account and you deposit money, technically what you've done is you've lent the money to the bank. It's a loan. Okay, that you could ask for repayment, but it's a loan. 
the money isn't being held in trust by the bank for you. It ceased to be your money when you deposited it. It became the bank's money. So you're a general creditor. That's right. So we need to understand that in the first place. Secondly, to then, you know, avoid bank runs and so on. So then you have deposit insurance and varies by country, but let's call it 100000 After 100000 that was never insured. So if a bank was to fail, everything over 100000 that wasn't covered by insurance uh, it, it is potentially lost, okay, because you're just, you're just an unsecured creditor. So that's always been the case. This is not particularly new. Uh, it just there hasn't been an example where people have woken up to this, mm-hmm. but that that's always been the case. If you have a gold account, then fundamentally that's no different. It, it doesn't matter whether you know it's a foreign currency account or a gold account or a silver account. They're all basically the same. So so that's that again. You're just a creditor. Okay, so they're not confiscating or stealing your gold. You never had any in the first place. In order to have an asset, you have to have a transfer of title. The same process applies whether you know it's a house, a boat, a car, any tangible asset. The transaction has to you know describe the asset, and the and the vendor in the transaction transfers the asset to the purchaser and that asset is described in detail so that's how you buy bullion in the case of bullion you need a transfer of title you need a document that gives you the refiner the serial number the exact weight and purity and said this bar with these details is now transferred to chris Mm -hmm. then you own gold but all these other things that people are worrying about is is the issue that 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 I tell people. Well, you just haven't read the fine print. The banks aren't doing anything that they're not allowed to do under their agreements. Just read the agreement. Mm-hmm. You never owned any gold in the first place. So that's that's the issue. Once you own the gold, then you can enter into a custody agreement. And, and put it into allocated storage. But it's your gold that you're putting in storage, and that's being held in trust. If the bank fails, that gold does not, never was, part of the assets of the bank. Right. They're storing it in trust for you. But you have to have clear title. If you can't show up with documentation to the bank regularity, or trustee in bankruptcy, as the case may be, that proves that you actually own the gold, okay? Then, it, then it's going to get into into the uh, you know unsecured creditor pool. So, in order to save money, people have have invested in or put their money in, into accounts, into certificates, thinking they own gold, but they never did. And and you know they they just needed to read the fine print, and that's the Cypress situation, and so on. Is, is becoming a surface, you know, the, the difference. Well, we saw this also with MF Global. I believe there was uh, at least one hedge fund I read about that believed it owned a bunch of gold uh, that was part of its uh, portfolio. And MF Global goes down, and all of a sudden that gold got sold out from under them as part of the general process, and that money was then pooled. And uh, then they, you know, got in line with everybody else to see what proportion of the remaining pool would be divvied back to them. They were outraged because they actually had the warehouse receipts and said, this is ours. Um, and even that wasn't good enough. Did you did you follow that story when it broke? Well, the, 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 I've, I've looked at the MF Global story, and, and you know, it's amazing that, that you know, nobody's getting prosecuted or being charged with everything because there's, there's a lot of issue. But I haven't read the, the fine print in that case. But MS, MF Global was a, a futures trader, and probably when you have your futures account, you've, you've um, um, allowed the, the 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 futures dealer to to you know hypothecate your gold or something of that order. If, if, if it's a, if it's a clear, if you want to really own gold, like I say, it's a, it's a two two step process. You have to purchase the bullion. 
have have proper documentation and that transfers title to specific bars and then you enter into a custody agreement you know that stores those bars on an allocated basis and identifies what the custodian can and can't do but with those documents properly done that the there can't be any third party claims or any you know bankruptcy issues with the custodian Right. So to those steps, I think uh, you would also be looking at an institution uh, that might hold your gold for you. Obviously, you'd want them insured and you'd probably want to have third party independent audits just to be clear on on all of that. Is there anything else that you'd want to be looking for? Well, exactly. Once 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 you own it, like and when we've set that process up in, in terms of the our bullion bars product to, to track all these these issues and, and we have various checks and balances to 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 give the the clients the you know the transparency and the assurances that the bullion is there with their name on it um, and so on and so forth so you know we have audits for both our funds and the bars so that's verified and so on but even like in in in, in our case like in the mutual fund we we have unallocated accounts, and and we have allocated storage of the bullion. And in our case, we need to have unallocated accounts to facilitate the day-to-day, um, you know, purchases and redemptions of the fund. Mm-hmm. But when in the when the unallocated accounts build up to the to the point where they're full bars, then we debit the unallocated accounts and move a full bar into the allocated. Uh, storage, but th- that's what I'm saying. So, if if you're, you know, a hedge fund and you're doing trading, then then in a lot of cases, uh, they they don't move it into allocated storage. They keep keep their unallocated accounts as their trading accounts because it's very quick and easy to you know to buy and sell out of an unallocated account, and there's no storage fees. Right. Right. Well, and you may or may not own it, uh, with emphasis on not. Uh, when oh, push and, comes and to un- in, in an unallocated account, you, you've you've simply got uh, you know, is essentially an IOU from from your bank. But you know, we keep that those amounts in our funds, like to 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 a very minimal percentage, you know, compared to the overall fund holdings. All right. Well, the title of your book, then, $10,000 Gold, can we turn briefly in the time we have to silver? Um, do you happen to, uh, what are your views there, and do you happen to have a, a similar uh, giant price target for silver in your story? Well, silver has the, the potential, obviously, I think, to, to have a, a higher, you know, percentage rise. It's by, you know, all measures in terms of the gold-silver ratios, it's running at about plus or minus 50 to 1 right now, and uh, there's been a lot of precedents, and you can make a lot of arguments that it should be 16 to 1. So as the gold price goes to 10,000, I, I think you'll have silver get closer to to a more reasonable gold-silver ratio as well as rise, and then so so it it will likely have a, a higher percentage increase than than gold will. All right. Well, the title of your book, $10,000 Gold, Why Gold's Inevitable Rise is the Investor's Safe Haven. Uh, We've been talking with Nick Barashev, President and CEO of Bullion Management Group. Nick, if people want to find out more about about your writings beyond the book, uh, how would they do that? Well, they they can go to our website and just look up bmgbullion.com. And we have, you know, from there, we, we have separated now into two websites, one one for the mutual fund and one for the uh, bullion bars. So a lot of the articles, everything are all posted there, and we have a number of reports people can download, and uh, also have a free newsletter that they can subscribe to. So all all that's available on the site. Well, absolutely. I would advise anybody listening, get the book, read it, and you want the history, you want the context, you want the background, because uh, this is a time when that context will reassert itself. It, It always does. Uh, the four most dangerous words in investing are this time it's different. Uh, it turns out it's never different. And gold has a very profound story to tell. Uh, and, and really, it's actually the story of, of how fiat currencies always seem to follow the same 
general pattern for very human reasons. And so humans are still humans, and we're probably going to see history repeat itself in some fashion. And this will be extraordinary because this time it's global. And that that is kind of a new wrinkle in the story, but uh, it's not really different at heart. So the book, $10,000 Gold, author's Nick Baroshev. Nick, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, my pleasure, Chris, anytime.